So the distributed coordination function, we talk about the first form for access, the basic access, and we treat access points and clients as the same, that is they follow the same set of rules. And the idea is that only one station transmits at a time. So all the stations are independent. <coughs> they follow the same set of rules and the basic steps in the rules are when you have data to send, you have something to send, you check whether the medium is idle for some DCF interframe space and we'll see the, the duration for that. If the medium is idle for that period of time, then again you have to wait a long, another period of time called the back off period. If it's also idle for the back off period, then you're allowed to transmit your data frame, just one data frame. And that has a, a maximum size. When we looked at the structure of the frame, its maximum size was 2,312 bytes of data plus the header and trailer. In practice, the maximum size is usually limited to 1,500 bytes because even though the wireless LAN supports 2,300 bytes, the wired LAN normally supports 1,500. So in most cases, the practical size for, or the practical maximum size for a data frame contains 1,500 bytes of data. You can have smaller frames. You transmit your data frame. The station that receives the data frame waits this short interframe space and sends back an ACK. Once you receive your, the ACK, then that data frame is successful and you can move on to further data, sending further data. <coughs> if you're waiting for in this DCF interframe space and you detect that the medium becomes busy, that is someone else is sending, then you wait until they stop sending, the medium becomes idle, and then restart from point one. That is, restart, you have to wait for the DCF interframe space and so on. Similar, if during the back off period you're waiting for the medium to, for to be idle for some period of time, if someone else starts transmitting during that, so you're interrupted, then you need to wait for them to finish transmitting and then restart again with some minor difference in that the back off we can think of as a counter that we count down. Let's say we have to count for 100 microseconds. Then we say when we start the back off we count 100, 99, 98 and once we get to zero we've finished the back off and we can transmit. If we're interrupted during the back off <coughs> at say 50 We've gone from 100, 99, 98, we got down to 50, but then someone else started sending. We interrupted. We need to wait for them to stop transmitting. The medium becomes idle again. Go back to diffs and continue from 50, counting down 50, 49, 48, and once we get to zero, we will transmit our data frame. We will see that and see some of the numbers involved uh, with our example and the examples that you go through. So we've seen so far that there are two interframe spaces. One's called the DCF interframe space and the other one's the short interframe space. Short is used between the, between the frames. That is, if you send data, the station that receives that data must wait this short interframe space and then transmit the app. Short is shorter than the diffs. It's always less than diffs. And that gives some form of priority to the transmitters. And that the station that has to wait the least amount of time will get the chance to transmit first. The others will have to wait. So when we have to wait just a short interframe space, anyone that has to wait a longer diffs 
the station waiting SIFs will get to transmit first and the others will have to wait or defer. The values of diffs and SIFs are fixed for each physical layer. So it's just a fixed number. We'll see some examples for the different physical layers on one later slide. <coughs> the back off period. The back off period, so after the diffs we must wait for the medium to be idle for the back off period. This back off period is not fixed. It's chosen by the station chooses a random number within some limits between 0 and CW. We'll see CW is our contention window size. So choose a random number between 0 and CW where CW is, is defined. And then that number multiplied by some slot time becomes the back off period. If the slot time is say 20 microseconds and CW is 31, then the station chooses a random number, an integer, between 0 and 31. Let's say they choose 5. Then they must back off 5 times by the slot time of 20 microseconds. That is 100 microseconds. So this, we'll see, is one way to make sure the stations do not transmit at the same time because we'll see that stations will choose different random numbers most likely and therefore wait or need to back off a different period of time. The station that has to wait the least amount of time will get to transmit first. What is the value of CW? Well it in fact changes over time. We'll come back to that once we go through the example. <coughs> Come in. If you can just leave, leave the access points here. Yeah. Okay. How many groups don't have an access point? I gave out two yesterday, and someone I think did anyone collect yesterday from the technicians? Yes. So there's three. Who doesn't have one? Just one person in each group. One, two, three, four. Okay. We have five. Should be enough. Good. So you can collect them. Not now. That's okay. You don't need it yet. There should be enough for everyone. get them to sign that and I'll return it to you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think, so this is five. Did you give out two yesterday, I think? Yeah. Or you, so that's seven and I gave out two. Nine should be enough for now. Enough. Yep. So no more. No more now. No. Thanks. Nine groups, we should have enough routers. Let's look at how basic access works through the example. These, these parameter values, diffs, sifs, the slot time, CW, and the minimum and maximum have values. Uh, one of these slides lists those values somewhere. I hope. Somewhere. Okay, here they are. Slide 47. List the values for 11 B, A and G. So they are fixed for each physical layer and different for the different physical layers because the physical layers have different characteristics and different speeds. We'll see that their values impact upon the performance. So we'll go through an example using the 802.11b, the older version, uh, where diffs is 50 microseconds, the short interframe space is 10 microseconds, the slot time is 20 microseconds. So when you choose a back off period, you select a random number and multiply by the slot time. So you back off a number of slots. CW, you choose the random number between 0 and CW. 
and the initial value of CW is CW min 31. It in fact changes or increments in different conditions up to a maximum value 1023. We'll use these numbers for 11b for our example but of course depending on the physical layer they're just different values and they're constants for that physical layer. Let me write them down so I don't forget. All in, or the, the time values are all in microseconds. So, in our example, I may omit the microseconds. Now let's go back to our example. This is the example that we started on yesterday where we saw that <coughs> we have three stations that are all within range of each other in this example, A, B and C doesn't matter whether one's an access point or the, it doesn't, it's, we don't care which one is an access point or a client because all stations follow the same rules. Three stations within range of each other. A wants to send some data to B. Sometime later, C wants to send some data to B. And sometime later, B wants to send some data to A. When does, when does a station want to send data? What does it depend upon? When does your laptop or mobile phone want to send a wireless LAN data frame? What triggers it wanting to send some data? What do you think? Your laptop needs to send, the wireless LAN is going to send some data across the, the wireless link. What do you think causes that? You are connecting to the server. You connecting to the server, which, so initially the user doing something, okay? You open your browser, you type in a URL or you click on a link. That triggers, if you recall from the layered stack, you have five layers. That's the user triggers the application to go to work, which creates some data to send. For example, if it's a request for a web page, it's a get request to retrieve a web page. That's sent down the stack to TCP to the TCP creates needs to create a SIN segment to establish a connection. That eventually gets to the wireless LAN layer, which becomes our data that we need to send. So it depends upon the user's input and the protocols used at the higher layers as to when that data is going to be sent. From our perspective, we'll think that the arrival of data to send at the wireless LAN layer is random. That is, from the wireless LAN's perspective, we get data from the higher layer at random intervals. We don't know when it will come. It's not going to come every 10 milliseconds unlikely, it's going to depend on many different factors. So at some point in time, the wireless LAN layer at station A may have data to send. Some random time later, it may have some more data to send and some more data to send. And over a long period of time, it have to send many data frames. And similar, B and C may have data to send at different points in time. So these points here in time, I've just chosen randomly or to assume that we don't know what triggers it, but we, at some point in time we're going to have data to send. And in fact, we may have a burst of data to send, 
That is, I have 10 kilobytes to send, maybe 10 or 8 different frames to send in a short period of time, and then nothing to send for one minute, and then a lot to send. It depends upon the applications, the user, and the protocols being used. So we'll assume mm -hmm. that the data arrives at random intervals. We cannot predict when it will arrive. <coughs> we wait for a DCF interframe space. If no one's transmitting, we wait for this back off period. If no one's transmitting, we can transmit the data frame. Eventually, we'll receive the ACK frame. If someone's transmitting when we're checking for the medium to be idle, either during diffs or during the back off period, we wait for them to stop transmitting. That is, we wait for the medium to become idle again. And because A is transmitting at this period of time, transmitting the data, I've shown the, the, the grade box to be the busy period of the medium. And therefore, C, that wanted to send, must defer. Defer, we must wait until the medium becomes free again or idle. But we see here the short interframe space working. From B and C's perspective, at the same point in time, the medium becomes idle because A stops transmitting. B must wait a short interframe space, for example, 10 microseconds, and C must wait 50 microseconds. For the, that is, the medium must be idle for 10 microseconds before it transmits the act, and for C it must be idle for 50 microseconds. If they start at the same time, then always the short interframe space will finish first and the act will be transmitted, which will make the medium busy again for C. That is, that diffs will be interrupted by the act. The act gets priority over the, da the data of C in this case. C, transmit, uh, C defers and then tries again. <coughs> Let's go through an example on the board, which is similar to this, uh, but do some calculations as we go and see how it performs. The example comes from a previous exam. Actually, maybe the first example is not from a previous exam. The example we'll go through here is, for, is available on the website. <coughs> I'll briefly show it here. This is just the scenario. We're going to use, just for the calculations, we're going to use 802.11b because I have the answers for it. And a summary of the, the parameter values that we have. We're going to assume the maximum data rate for 11b and which is 11 megabits per second. The parameters for diffs, sifs, and so on are up here. Same values, I hope. 50, 10, and 20 microseconds, CW. And to do the calculations of how long things take, we need to know the size of the frames that we're going to transmit. So we're going to make some assumptions about the size of the frames. The header and trailer of a data frame is 34 bytes. The ACK frame, we'll assume, is 14 bytes. RTS and CTS we're not covering yet. We'll cover that in a later example. We're going to assume that the data frame, when we transmit it, 
is transmitted at 11 megabits per second. So we have our data frame, we transmit those bits at 11 million bits per second. That's the maximum data rate. But we're going to assume something slightly different for the transmission of the control frames, the ACK and later RTS-CTS, that will send at the lowest data rate, 1 megabit per second. This is in fact typical of what's done or what was done in 802.11b. You send your data at the highest speed possible, but the, your control frames, you will often send at a lower speed, possibly the lower speed. Why? Recall that in general that the lower the data rate, the larger the distance of the, the transmission. That is, if you want to cover, if you are covering just a short distance, you can transmit at a high data rate. The larger the distance, the data rate that we can achieve across the link gets lower and lower. So if we transmit at one megabit per second, the lowest data rate, then potentially someone a long way away can receive that and hear that ACK. And we see that with the ACK and later the RTS-CTS, it's important for other stations to hear them, especially the RTS-CTS later. So it's important to get as many stations as possible to, to receive them. So another reason why they were transmitted at a lower data rate is because with the old devices, pre 802 b they would only support lower data rates. So they did not support 11 megabits per second. So even though the old devices cannot understand the data being sent, they can understand an ACK, RTS and CTS. And we'll see later that if a station that's not involved in the data transfer can hear one of these frames, then that helps in the, uh, in the data transmission. So for now, 1 megabit per second for the control frames, 11 for the data frame. And we, we will, what will we do? Which one first? We'll use those values for our example that we'll go through on the board. So let's go back to, uh, let's go to the board and draw this diagram. Who, has a, who doesn't have a spare piece of paper? If not, if you have no space, then you can write on here. If you, do you have space on the back? We're going to go through several examples, so it makes sense to, for you to draw them on a larger piece of paper and draw them clearly. some more parameters from our example. So the first example we're going to go through is using basic access. To keep things simple, we'll assume the amount of data we carry in each frame is 1,341 bytes, the payload.
the maximum size that can be carried is 2,312. For this example, I've chosen 1,341, and you'll see why. I chose that strange number in a moment. And all data frames that we transmit are the same size. All stations, we're going to have three stations, A, B, and an access point. All stations are within range of each other. They can all hear each other. And this example, client A wants to send data to access point at time zero, or at the start of our example. Sometime later, 1,420 microseconds later, the access point is going to send data, to, or wants to send data to client A. And at time 220 microseconds after the start of our example, client B wants to send data to the access point. <coughs> so we want to transfer, transfer three data frames in this example. Now, when a station needs to back off, they actually choose a random number within some range and then use that to work out how many slots to back off. So that I have the answers, I'm going to choose these random numbers. A is going to choose number 10, access point 3, and B 10. So given that, we'll go through and draw on the board the, the timing of the, all of the different events in the DCF basic access. And I'll remove this screen so we have some space. Go up. So we have, we're going to draw as time increases, if I can get this straight. Station A, the access point. and station B. So as we move to the right, time increases. And let's say that time here is zero. All the times I use in this example are in microseconds, the same units. So if I recall, A wanted to send data to B no, to the access point at A to the access point at time zero. Access point wants to send data to A at time 1420 and B to the access point at time 220. <coughs> so that's when they have data ready to send then they must follow the rules to try and transmit that data in a frame. <coughs> what happens first? What happens? How do we get started? What do we do? Or what does one of the stations do? DIFS. Station A has data to, that it wants to send. So at this point in time, we'll mark that. Some data ready to send. That is, if you look at the layer's perspective, the higher layer, the network layer, has sent an IP datagram to the wireless LAN layer. So it's received it inside the computer, so it has data to send, so now it triggers the start of this process, which the first step is check if no one is transmitting for the period diffs, the DCF interframe space. So station A, you can think, has its receiver on. If it starts to receive a signal, the medium is considered busy. If it receives no signal, then there is, the medium is considered idle. And it must be idle for the 
DCF into frame space? Is it going to be idle for the DCF into frame space? Yes or no? Is it going to be idle? <laughs> yes or no? Yes. Why? <laughs> You told him yes, why? <laughs> why is it idle? A and said Y and B is free. Yeah, there's no one transmitting. That is, assuming there's no other stations to keep things simple, that's B, sorry. There's only three stations in the area. Access point has nothing to send until sometime later. B has nothing to send until some time later. So the DCF into frame space is 50 microseconds. We start that at time zero. So this is, I'll just mark it as diffs. We're not doing anything, we're not transmitting anything here. I'm just, we just draw it on the diagram to indicate the time it takes of 50 microseconds. And of course, no one else is transmitting, so during all of that 50 microseconds, we've sensed the medium to be idle, which is what we want to happen. So we listen for 50 microseconds. If nothing is heard, then that first step is passed. So if we start at time zero, we'll keep track of the time or the clock as we move along. This would be time 50. My diagram won't be to scale, but we'll see. We'll just make note that sometime later, B wants to send to the access point at time 220, which is going to be somewhere around here. Just keep that in mind. So what does A do now? What does station A do? Back off. And for the back off, it in fact needs to choose a random number. And that determines how many slots it needs to back off. And for this example, it chooses the random number 10. It chose the random number between 0 and 31. Let's say R, the number of slots. We choose a random inter integer between 0 and 31. 0 and some value, where that some value is the minimum value of CW, the contention window. We will see later that that actually changes, but the initial value is 31. Choose a random number between 0 and 31. This time it chose 10, which means it needs to back off 10 slots, or 200 microseconds. So the medium will need to be idle for that 200 microseconds to move to the next step. So if we start at time 50, then we start the back off. I'll just write BO. And I'll just note, we need to back off for 10 slots or a total of 200 microseconds, 10 times 20. So we're waiting or checking the medium. Is it busy? Is it busy? The access point we know is not going to transmit until some time later. We're going to see that B wants to do something soon. If, it's, if the medium is idle for the full 200 microseconds, then that would bring us up to time, what? 250. Is the medium idle until time 250? Yes, because there will be no one else transmitting during that time. But we need to be careful. Let's look what B does. Remember these stations are independent of each other, three different devices. They don't know whether the other station is doing diffs or back off because 
Station A is not transmitting here, it's just sitting listening. B doesn't know that it's listening, nor does it, it doesn't know it's in the divs or the back off. So sometime later, at time 220, B wants to send some data to the access point. So B starts the procedure. It will check if the medium is idle for diffs. 220, it must go from 220 up to 270, 50 microseconds. What's going to happen? What's the next event that happens in our sequence between those three stations? A starts to transmit. <coughs> we will see if B will not be transmitting by the time of 250 because B would have to start at 220 the diffs and then that would take to 270 and then do a back off. So between 50 and 250 no one else is transmitting. The medium is idle. Therefore A completes the back off period. It had to wait for 10 <coughs> slots 200 microseconds from 50 to 250 and no one else transmitted so therefore it can move to the next step and the next step is transmit. Transmit the data. We'll come back to how that impacts on B. First, how long are we going to transmit the data for? How many microseconds? What's the data frame transmission time? You have, so in fact the example that we're going through is in your handouts on page 47. The, the, deep, the, the numbers, not the answer, but the numbers. And on page 49, I forgot about that, you have some space to write the answer. There you go, you don't need this blank paper. On page, not slide 47, on page 47 in your handouts, page 47 contains the setup for the example and page 49 and later contains the space to write your answer. <coughs> How long does it take to transmit the data frame? Sorry? A thousand microseconds. How do we calculate that? We have 1,341 bytes. Did I write that? Yeah, the payload. That's the amount of data. and we transmit at 11 megabits per second. What else have we assumed? What about the header? We've assumed on, on the start of the example that the header is included, and the trailer as well, on the data frame is 34 bytes. We have 1,375 bytes to transmit at 11 megabits per second, which is, you've got the calculator, 1375 divided by 11 times 8 is 1,000. Yeah, so that's the reason I chose the number, because it gives us a nice round answer. That is, total number of bytes in our data frame, if I draw the data frame, we have some header, a 
we have a trailer at, at the end and we have some payload, the data that we want to carry. The header plus the trailer is 34 bytes in length. We made that assumption that uh, if we look at the structure of the, the wireless LAN frame, we'll see the, the size. And the payload we chose to be 1,341 bytes. So the total number of bytes to send in the frame is 1,375. Multiply by 8 to convert to bits. Divide by 11 million, 11 megabits per second. And you get 1,000 microseconds. That is, the transmission time for our data frame is 1,000 microseconds. That's why I chose 1341 bytes, so that we get a nice round number for the transmission time. So if we start transmitting at time 250, we're going to finish transmitting at 1250. I'll just make note here. Uh, just make note that this is the data frame and it's 1,341 bytes of data. Now, to show that the medium is busy, I'll just mark on here, okay, because someone's transmitting, the medium is busy during that period of time. So we can see how that impacts upon the other stations. A has done the diffs, the back off, transmits the data. In the meantime, let's come back to B. B wants to send some data. At time 220, it starts the DCF into frame space. It checks, is the medium idle? It's idle, it's idle. But at time 250, When A starts to transmit the data, the medium becomes busy. It interrupts the diffs. We're assuming that there's no propagation delay, very small propagation delay here. That is, as soon as A transmits, B receives that, which is a fair assumption. Any problems so far? We're going to go through in detail all the steps to see how the deep basic access works. <coughs> Since we interrupt the DCF into frame space, we don't complete it. B does not complete it. So we say it must wait until the medium becomes idle again. And we usually refer that as to, it defers, defers to access. It waits. The way that you draw these may vary. And so you'll see on different diagrams it varies whether I draw it a box or, or just some lines. But it's really just showing the different uh, events that are happening from the perspective of each node. Now B is deferring. It's going to defer until the medium becomes idle again, which we know will be here at time 1250 because we know that A is going to stop transmitting there. What about the access point? Well, that's, that's sometime later, 1,420 microseconds. That's a little bit out. B defers. Someone else is transmitting. It waits for them to finish. So A transmits the data. Once the data frame is fully received, remember they're transmitting to the access point, then the access point now has the data at time 1250, and they know it's to them. They would look at the header of the data frame and see the destination address. The access point knows that the data is destined to it and sends back an acknowledgement after the short interframe space. 
The short interframe space is the, the access point doesn't check if the medium is busy or idle. It just waits that time and transmits the act, no matter what. So, you can just denote that here. SIFs of 10 microseconds, which will bring us from 1250 up to 1260. <coughs> and then immediately send the act. How big, how long does it take to transmit the acknowledgement? Did I, we make some assumption? Ah yes, it's on on, in the example on the first page, uh, on the example towards the bottom, I've done some calculations. It takes, if we've got 112 bits, that is if the, we assume the ACK is 14 bytes, uh, that's 112 bits, and we're sending it 1 megabit per second, that's 112 microseconds. Why did I have such a strange number? I'm going to make life a little bit easier for us and we'll assume that the ACK, not 112 micro, mi microseconds, but it takes just 100 microseconds. Just so that our numbers stay uh, rounded. To so let's assume it takes 100 microseconds to transmit the ACK. Therefore, we'd tr finish transmitting at time 1360. And at that time, our first data frame has successfully been tran transferred from A to the access point. So A has received the ACK. It knows the data has been successfully delivered and can move on to further transmissions. Let's come back to B. What happens from B's perspective? At time 1250, the medium become idle again. <coughs> so it goes back to step one. Wait for the DCF interframe space. So it starts waiting for diffs here. Diffs needs to go for 50 microseconds, but it's going to be interrupted again. Because we need to wait for 50 microseconds, which is going to go from 1250 to 1300, but we're going to see that the ACK is going to interrupt us because someone's going to transmit again between time 1260 and 1360. So although we start the DCF interframe space or waiting that period of time, it will not complete. It'll be interrupted and we'll have to defer again. And after the ACK is transmitted, then B goes back to step one again. Wait for the DCF interframe space. Starting at time 1360. 50 microseconds brings us to time 1410. And then B can start the back off period because no one is transmitting during that period. A is not doing anything. A is finished. Access point's not doing anything yet. It doesn't start to 1420. So station B chooses a random number and it chooses 10. Why did I choose 10? Access point chooses a random number 10, that is 10 slots to back off. Note that it's got no relationship to this 10. I just chose that value really so that the numbers work out in the calculation. But it just chooses a random number, again between 0 and 31. And of course, these are two separate computers. The, the way that it chooses random numbers is independent. They, uh, the chance of choosing the same as someone else is unlikely. We'll calculate that later. 
but in this case they chose 10. So it needs to back off 10 slots or 200 microseconds, which should take it, if it's successful to wait that time, that is no one else is transmitting, from 1410 up to 1610. And if no one else was transmitting during that period, it would start the data transmission. What's, what happens next? Spend five minutes calculating, determining what happens next on your own. That is complete going through this scenario, looking at what each station does. spend several minutes continuing on with this. Access point wants to send data to A or it has data ready to send to A at time 1420. Sorry? How big? Uh, the, the data, in all cases, the, the three data frames are the same size. So what, what's the next thing that I'm going to draw on this diagram? What's the next event that's important? Keep going, good. Okay, I see several people with on the right track. We need to see what the access point does next. So you need to look at time one four two oh what happens. Remember the normal steps, diffs, back off, transmit, sifts, act, unless you're interrupted during the diffs or back, up, back off. Uh, the, back offs, the back off duration is chosen by each station. Say you have three stations, A, B, and access point. When they choose the back off, they select a random number between 0 and 31. Sometimes they may choose the same random number, most times not. 
It just turns out in my example that A chose 10, B also chose 10. Access point chooses 3. Access point chooses 3 as a random number. What's the access point do? At time 1420, the access point starts the procedure. Random number chosen by the access point is three. Three. So uh, every time it, it can change. Yes, so you call the random function. Think, okay, it calls a, a its own function rand, and choose a random number between two values, between zero and thirty-one in our case. Just turns out when A chose the random number, it got ten. When B chose, it got ten as well. And when access point chooses, it gets three. If it ch needs to choose again later, it just calls the random number uh, generator again, and we'll get probably a different number. So every new map of you get the random number can change. Every yes, every new back off period, it, you choose a new random number, <coughs> and but be careful. If you're interrupted in a back off period, you don't choose a random number, you continue counting down. So, what's the next thing that I'm going to draw? What am I going to draw? What's the next thing that happens? What's the next thing that happens up here? Anyone? What's going to happen? From on my diagram, what's the next event? Or the next thing I need to consider? The diffs of the access point. Remember, these stations are independent, so I can only do one thing at a time, but the, the station B is doing the diffs and then the back off. At the same time, at time 1420, the access point has data to send to A. So it starts. Diffs. It would finish 50 microseconds later, 1470. When is the back off supposed to finish for B? At what time sh does it need to go to? Anyone? One, one six one zero. Oh. Ten slots. Each slot is twenty microseconds, two hundred microseconds. B needs to sense the medium to be idle for two hundred microseconds, so it should go to one six one zero. Oh. But of course, this is sensing the medium to be idle, idle, idle. It's going to, if we get there, then it can transmit the data. But come back to the access point. The medium is idle here. No one's transmitting during this time. A is doing nothing. B is not transmitting in this time because it's backing off. 
So also, access point starts his back off period. It chooses a random number three. It chooses between 0 and 31. It chooses 3 for this example. So it must wait 60 microseconds, which would take it to what? 1530. And then what happens? It starts transmitting. That is, the access point starts transmitting. The access point completed its back off period. No one was transmitting during that time. It wasn't interrupted. So diffs, back off, transmit data. Same size as what A transmitted, just to keep things simple. What's next? What am I going to draw next? Or what, what happens with B? B defers. Access point has completed the back off. No one was transmitting, so it sends the data frame. The red here indicates that someone is transmitting. From all other nodes' perspective, the medium becomes busy. The medium will be busy between 1530 and our data transmission time is 1000 microseconds. So the medium is going to busy, be busy between 1530 and 2530. Coming back to station B, diffs, the medium was idle, back off, the medium's idle, idle, idle. We need to go to 1610, but then we're interrupted. The medium becomes busy at time 1530. How many slots did we complete fully for the back off from station B? Think of the slots in the back off, we count down. I choose a random number 10. Every slot is 20 microseconds. After 20 microseconds, I decrement the number. 10, start at 10. After 20 microseconds, 9, 8, 7. Once we get down to 0, we can transmit. What did we get down to? How many slots between here and when we defer? Or simpler, how much time? How much time did it back off for? Six slots, or 120 microseconds. That is, it started at 1410. It was interrupted at time 1530, which is 120 microseconds, or six slots because every slot is 20 microseconds. If you can think of it from the perspective we count down, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, but then we're interrupted. That's important because later, when we continue, when the medium becomes idle, we don't choose a new random number for back off. We don't start from 10. We will start from 4 because we need to back off 10 slots. We've backed off 6 slots. We're going to continue later. Finish the diagram. Look from the perspective of the access point and A. That will be the easy part and then continue for B.
what does the access point do now? <coughs> oh, sorry. What happens with the data that was sent to the access point, uh, from the access point? So what's next For on my diagram? Short interframe space at A and then SIFS and ACK. Good. We're sending the data from access point to station A. A receives the data frame, finished receiving at time 2530. 1530 was the start, 1000 microseconds. Short interframe space takes just 10, which will be 2540, and then the ACK. And we said the ACK takes 100 microseconds. So 242530, 2540 after SIFs, and 2640 is the time at which the ACK will be completed transmitting and successfully received by the access point. Access point receives the, the ACK here and now that data transfer has been complete. AP has sent the data to A and been successfully ACKed. Coming back to station B, we were deferring because someone was sending. We finish the deferral because the medium becomes idle. We'll start the diffs, but we're going to be interrupted again because someone is going to send an ACK. So although we start the diffs, it doesn't, doesn't complete. We interrupted and defer again. And therefore, we can start the diffs again now. If we're interrupted during that DCF interframe space, then we must wait until the medium becomes idle again and then start again. And now it's easy. Diffs, back off, data, SIFs, ACK. Who has an answer as what time the ACK the final ACK is received. Find out the time at which the last ACK for the data that went from B to the access point is completed when we've finished everything. Have I done it correct?
let's finish this this example. What's next? Back off. At time two six four zero, we start here. Diffs for fifty. Fifty, if I can add up, takes us to two six nine zero. Back off for how many slots? Four slots. We don't use a new random number. We continue on from what we did there. Counting in slots. We completed six slots fully here. So we had ten to complete. We've got another four to go. Note that if, for example, this was 130 microseconds, it would still be four slots. 130 microseconds is six and a half slots. But we don't count in halves in terms of the slots. We count, okay, six and a half slots. We've completed only six slots in full. So we still have a full four remaining. So we have four slots remaining, which is 80 microseconds, which will bring us to 2770. Transmit the data, certainly not to scale. It's 1,341 bytes which is 1,000 microseconds, brings us to 3770. We're sending to the access point, short interframe space, ACK. And the time at which the ACK is fully Transmitted and received is 3,880 microseconds after the start of our example. Did I get the same answer as last time? Yes. Anyone else get that answer? So you just need to be careful with the times for each of those uh, steps. Any problems? So what have we seen? We've seen the basic operation. We wait for a DCF interframe space. The medium must be idle. And same, we back off. The medium must be idle. Diffs is fixed, always 50. Always 50 in 802.11b. In 11g and n, it's a different value, but it's fixed. The back off, we choose a random number but within some range. And that tells us how many slots to back off, where the slot time is fixed for a particular physical layer. The data, data size may vary. For our example, we fixed the payload, and we said the header was 34 bytes. We transmitted at 11 megabits per second, giving us a transmission time of 1,000 microseconds. After the data, the receiver waits for SIFs. It doesn't, in fact, check if the medium is idle. It just waits that time. It gives the receiver enough time to turn around from receiving mode on its transceiver to transmitting mode, and then transmits the ACK. And then we've tra completed that data transfer. If the medium becomes busy during a diffs period, we need to restart once it becomes idle again. If the medium becomes busy during a back off period, then we restart with a diffs when the medium becomes idle again and continue the back off and then transmit the data. Did we have any collisions? Before we discuss the Im some other issues here, any problems with this procedure? Quiz or an exam, you can answer a such similar type of question. And I think in all past exams, there's such a question.
So in this case, we've achieved our objective of only one station transmits data at a time. We had three stations wanting to transmit, but not all at the same time, so that was helpful. And the result was A transmitted, access point transmitted, and then B transmitted. Note B was unlucky in this case, because B wanted to start transmitting at time 220 here, but had to defer a lot and was interrupted many times and only finished at this time. Although it's not a good representation of, of network or client throughput because there's only one, one frame, we can look at throughput in terms of how much data was delivered during some period of time. In real life, to look at throughput across a network or across multiple stations, we'd need to look at many packets, many frames. Looking at just three frames is not, very in, uh, and not a very good indication of performance. But the approach is, okay, how much data was delivered in the total amount of time? In our network, our wireless LAN with three stations, an access point and two clients, what was the total amount of data or payload transmitted or delivered in this example? How much payload? How many bytes? How much bytes was delivered to the destination in this example? Oh. Sorry, I forgot it. So I thought it was 1,000. 1,341 is the size of the one frame. We have three frames delivered. In the network, we had three by 1,341 bytes delivered. How much time did it take? Well, we started at zero. We finished at 3880. <coughs> Three data frames, each containing 1,341 bytes, convert to bits, divided by the total time is about 8.3 megabits per second. That's the network throughput, we could say in this case. Now, this is not, although it's a way to calculate it, it's not a good indicator of network performance because uh, to get a good indicator, you need to look at many frames, not just three frames. And if you look at a thousand frames over time, then that will give you a, a better indicator of real performance. But this is the way you, it could be calculated. Look at the total amount of data delivered divided by the total time it took gives us 8.29 megabits per second. Our data rate was 11 megabits per second. So we do not achieve our throughput is not the same as the maximum data rate. Why? Because we have many overheads. We have time where we're not transmitting, diffs and back off. We have time where we're sending header. In this data frame, some of it is payload, most, but some is header. So that's an overhead. We have time when we're transmitting acts. They are overheads from the perspective of our throughput. <coughs> so it's just that during this time, here and here that we're transmitting real data. Now, what if we had a slightly different scenario? <coughs> what if station B, when it chose its random number here in the back off, chose 6 instead of 10? What happens? 
everything's the same except station B chose six to six slots to back off instead of ten. If we everything's the same up until here. We choose to back off six slots. Six slots is 120 microseconds. So at 1410, that would take us to 1530, which is here. If we chose six slots instead of ten, remember it's just a random number, it may have been six, then it would complete the back off at time 1530, and what happens next? Collision. B completes the back off at 1530. No one was transmitting during that time. Access point completes its back off at exactly the same time. No one was transmitting in that time. Therefore, that would allow each of them to transmit. B would be transmitting its data. And at the same time, access point would start transmitting data. We have a collision because If two stations transmit data at the same time, the receiver will not be able to understand. <coughs> from A's perspective, B, it will receive signals from two transmitters. They will interfere with each other and A will not make sense of anything that's received. And what happens then? Well, I will not draw it because it will become complex, but A will not understand anything transmitted and therefore will not send back an ACK. It just treats it as noise. It doesn't know someone has sent a data frame to it. So A does not send back an ACK. And we have another parameter involved. Access point sent data to A. A did not understand anything, will not send an ACK. But the access point is expecting an ACK. If it doesn't receive an ACK within some time, then it recognizes that data wasn't successful and we'll need to retransmit. There's another parameter, so we'll, all right, we transmit, there'll be a collision here, no ACK, there's some ACK timeout value. <coughs> that is, if we don't receive an ACK within some period of time, then assume we've had an error and retransmission, initiate the retransmission. In the Handout, I think, let's assume the ACK timeout is 110 microseconds. It should be enough time to, for the receiver to wait for the SIFs and transmit the ACK. If nothing has been received within 110 microseconds, something's gone wrong. Because what should happen <coughs> is that after here, 10 microseconds for SIFs, 100 for ACK, we should immediately, well, we should have received it by then. If not, then we retransmit. The exact value of this varies in different implement implementations. In fact, another way we could do it is say, if we haven't started to receive something by after 10 microseconds, retransmit. A retransmission everything is the same as a original frame. Diffs, back off, data, SIFs, ACK. With one exception. So a retransmission, we want to send the same data frame again, we do a diffs, ignoring what happens here. Back off. The back off maximum value changes for retransmission. Originally, we chose a random number between 0 and 31. If we need to retransmit a frame, 
this value increases, it effectively doubles. It will become between 0 and 63. Choose a random number between 0 and 63. Alright, still may be small, it could be 3, it could be 60, it could be 30, but we choose a random number, data, hopefully SIFS and app. So retransmission, everything is the same except this value increases. If we are unlucky and get another collision and have to transmit again, retransmit, then this would almost double again up to 127. We'll see the pattern shortly. Let's explain why, why we do that. Let's come back to our presentation. This is an, the error control mechanism. If we don't receive the ACK within some timeout value, then we initiate a retransmission. And retransmission is the same steps, except the back off is chosen from potentially, or chosen from a larger range. Here, the initial data transmission, the back off is chosen between zero, as a random number between zero and the minimum value of CW, the contention window. In, all right, we've removed it. In our example, the minimum value was 31. Choose a random number between zero and 31. For a retransmission of that data frame, we increment that value to be, as we see here, add one, mult or double, subtract one. So it goes from 31 up 63. And then if we have to retransmit again, we don't receive the ACK. If we have another retransmission, it will go from 63 up to 127. And if another retransmission, up to 255. And it will keep going up until it reaches the maximum value of CW. In our example, it's 1,023. After which it will main maintain at that level. That increment of the, this value, the upper limit from the random number selector is shown here. Initial value, first retransmission, second, third, fourth, fifth. And there is a maximum number of retransmissions that we can make. I think by default it's seven. But we can change that. You can change that in an access point or a client. But if it's seven, we effectively double this contention window until we get to the maximum value, CW max, 1,023, and we keep retransmitting until we reach the maximum number of retransmissions. After which, we won't try again. We'll report some error back to the higher layer. And that may eventually come back uh, to the application and the user. Okay, you cannot transmit data because maybe the link is no longer working, something's gone wrong. So we have a maximum number of retransmissions and we increment the contention window or double the contention window for each retransmission. If the data is successful and we send a new frame, we're back to 31 again, the original value. It's only for the retransmissions for that one frame do we increment that? That's the approach. Why do we do it? How does this help us? Come back. Uh, can we? Remove some of this.
Firstly, why does the random number of slots help us? Or why do we choose a random number? Consider this case. Some station has transmitted some data. Here's the data finishing. We had the diffs and back off beforehand. We've had the short interframe space and an ACK. So that happened beforehand. And both A, B, and C. Both B and C have some data to send. So they've been deferring. They're going to defer while A is transmitting the data, defer during the act, and they'll finish deferring at the same time. And they'll follow the same steps of diffs, So we're considering an example where B and C want to send some data. They started to count down beforehand, but they had to defer because someone else was sending. So when the ACK is finished, they wait for the diffs, which is the same time. So they'll finish the diffs at the same time. If we had no back off period, we just had to wait for diffs, then they would both transmit their data now. That would be a problem because that would be a collision. That's why we need the back off period in here. Diffs is fixed. If both, if two stations finish their deferral at the same time, if there was no back off, they would both transmit their data at the same time, resulting in a collision. So that's why we introduce this back off period which is randomly chosen. The random number means that hopefully, in most cases, one station will choose to back off a sh smaller number of slots than the other. For example, they both finish diffs. B chooses three slots. C chooses ten slots. B will ch finish the back off before C does. And once it's finished the back off, it can send the data. Interrupting C. At this point, whichever station chooses a smaller back off value will get to transmit. It's a game. That is, they are both competing to see who gets to transmit first. The one that chooses the smallest back off value gets to transmit the data first. C will have to defer and wait until that's complete and then try again. Having a random number means that it's fair amongst the stations because there's equal probability that they, one will choose the smaller than the other. If, for example, B chooses 3 this time and C chooses 10, then B gets to transmit first. But sometime later when they have data to send again, same problem happens. Well, again, they choose different, or they choose random numbers. And we keep doing that. Then on average, they'll each get equal opportunity to transmit. Half of the time, B will win and choose a smaller value. Half of the time, C will win and choose a smaller value. If two stations choose random numbers independently, then half of the time, one will choose smaller than the other, and the other half of the time, the other one will choose smaller. So that's why we have this random back off here. So that two stations don't transmit at the same time here, causing a collision. One of them chooses a smaller value and gets to transmit. The other will have to wait. Is there a chance of, choose, of having a collision there? Yes. If both of them choose the same number, then a collision will occur. If they both choose five, and back off the same amount of time, they'll both transmit at the same time. What's the chance that, that two stations choose the same number if they independently choose random numbers between 0 and 31? You can calculate the probability of that happening, and it's quite small. Now, 
the idea with the retransmissions is that if we do have a collision, they both choose five. Unlucky for us, but they do. We have a collision, then we need to retransmit. The idea is to increase this value such that the chance that two of them choose the same value again is much smaller. And the chance of two stations choosing the same value between 0 and 31 is higher than the chance that they'll choose the same value between 0 and 63. So by increasing this, we decrease the chance that they'll choose the same value. And that's the concept of when you need to retransmit, we want to avoid collisions. And to avoid collisions, try to avoid choosing the same back off slots. And therefore just reduce the probability of that happening by choosing from a larger range. Choose a random number between 0 and 1023, and you choose between 0 and 1023, what's your number? And yours was? <laughs> a random number between 0 and 1023? Okay, the chance of the two of them independently choosing the same number is very low. Now, choose a random number between 0 and 3, and you choose a random number between 0 and 3, what was your number? 0 and 3? <laughs> You choose between 0 and 3. Don't tell me. You choose between 0 and 3. 0 and 3. What is yours? Very or much higher chance that they'll choose the same number in that case. So the idea, increase this range, and the chance that they'll choose the same number is much lower. And if we have one retransmission, then we decrease the chance of the next attempt being a collision. And that's why we increase the contention window for each read transmission. <coughs> that's why we're doing this increase. Reduce the chance of collisions there. What's the problem? We reduce the chance of collisions, what's the problem of this approach? Why don't I just set, instead of 31, I set it to 1,023 here. What's the problem with this? Instead of using between 0 and 31, I say you must use on the first frame between 0 and 1,023 for the back off slots. What's the problem with that? It will reduce the chance that two choose the same number, so it reduces the chance of collisions. That's good, but what's the problem? Way too long. Well, I don't know if we still have it drawn, but for the back off period, the the larger the value we choose, the longer we have to wait and therefore the lower the throughput in the end, the less efficient we are. So we want to start with a small value to make sure that we don't have to wait for long. But we want to have a higher value to reduce the chance of collisions. So we start with a smaller value. If we do have a collision, increment it or, or double it effectively. What have we missed? We've covered the basics, I think, error control. Once we retransmit too many times, let's say 7 is the default value, there's an error. We, we don't try again. We tell the higher layer there's a problem. And that explains the, the purpose of that contention window and it doubling all the time. The larger the value, the less chance will choose the same random number and the less chance of collision. However, the larger the value of CW, the longer time spent in back off, therefore the less efficient. 
So we need to choose a trade-off there. That works well. That is, there's a low chance of collisions. There's still some chance of collisions, but we'll retry and the chance of collisions goes down so that it's an efficient way to transfer data. There's one scenario that arises that causes many collisions, and that's the problem of hidden stations. The scenario is that we have an access point and two clients, for example, where the clients are within range of the access point. A can hear the access point, the access point can hear the client, but the clients are outside of range of each other. So B and the access point are within range, but when A transmits, B doesn't hear that transmission. It's too far away. And similar, when B transmits, A doesn't hear the transmission. A and B, in this case, are hidden from each other. They're hidden stations or hidden terminals. In this scenario, it's much easier to get collisions because what can happen, A has data to send, B has some data to send, diffs, back off, A starts transmitting data. The access point knows, it's starting to receive that, but B doesn't know that, the ac that A is sending the data. B is too far away, it will not receive the signal. It's su such a weak signal, it ignores it. So from B's perspective, it starts the diffs, it starts the back off. From B's perspective, no one is sending. The medium is still idle because it can't hear this transmission. So it eventually completes its back off and starts its own transmission, both to the access point. They're both transmitting at the same time to the access point. From the access point's perspective, the receiver, this is a collision. Those two transmitted signals interfere with each other. The access point can't understand either of them. We have a collision here. They time out because there's going to be no act coming back. Try again, back off a longer time. If we're unlucky, we may have a collision again. So in this scenario of two stations being hidden from each other, the chance of a collision is much higher because they cannot hear each other and they don't know when the other is transmitting. And every retransmission or every collision and resulting retransmission sp means more time not sending the real data, not delivering the real data and leads to very low performance, very low throughput. So what we'll go through next week is a way to overcome this problem and what we do is introduce two new frames. Called RTS and CTS, request to send, clear to send. Before sending data, send a request to send, respond with a clear to send with the idea that these two small frames will inform other stations that someone's about to send. The idea that even though A and B cannot hear each other, if A sends a request to send to the access point and the access point sends back a clear to send, B will hear the clear to send because B is within range. It will not hear the request to send but B will hear the clear to send that comes back and once it hears that, it knows someone else is about to send and then it can defer. So next week we'll go through this RTS-CTS mechanism and show on a detailed example how that works.